I'm so tired. This whole teaching from home thing. I'm just like making videos all day, every day. So how do I unwind? By making a Romichael video. Sure, why not? Bloop, boop, boop. Bloop, doop, doop. All right, hi everybody. Um, today, finally giving you our official Final Fantasy VII review. Ramin isn't actually joining me for this. Um, he We did the playthrough review together months ago, and he also played the remake demo. I didn't, but he feels like he's sort of Final Fantasy VII'd out, which I understand, totally fine. But he did still participate in the making of this video. Um, he filled out our score sheet. I, I have his thoughts from the playthrough reviews, and our opinions are really pretty close on just about everything to do with this game. So I thought, okay, no problem. I have all this information ready to go. I can throw together this really quick video review. I have 11 pages of notes. All right, so first off, I've got a new scoring nuance that I want to try out. Um, I've broken the points out of 10 for each of the things that we graded together into different subsections. Zero through two, really bad. Three to four, not good. 5 to 7, fine to decent, 8 to 9, pretty good, 10, great. So, jumping through the large sections of this, starting with the story. The pacing of this game we gave a 6, tropes, 6, world, 8 overall, cohesion of the world, we gave a 5. This, to me, is one of the most disappointing parts of this game. Most of the individual parts of the game are good, I just feel like they don't always fit together super well. Midgar is so cool, and then you leave, and it's just like all of the other Final Fantasies for the most part. One interesting thing in the story that I feel like I need to bring out is the cross-dressing subplot. It may not have been intended by the game's creators or noticed by most of its players, but the whole cross-dressing sequence smacks of an insidious, internalized, too often culturally acceptable transphobia. While a cross-dressing sequence can be sensitively portrayed, even with humor involved, it, but that is a much more delicate scenario, the resulting fear and disgust Don Corneo and his henchmen display when Cloud reveals that he's a man just add to the insensitive and dangerous treatment of this whole episode. There's some things that are disappointing in the story other, other than just that. Sometimes it's really hard to know what you're supposed to do next. If you go to every available town, sometimes you'll get a clue, but why would you think to go back to that town you've been to or to that house in the middle of nowhere by itself? That didn't seem important before. The party too seems to just be guessing their way through a lot of the game and they make some important decisions based on guesswork. Way too much of the game is gotta follow Sephiroth. One of the best plot devices in the game is the repeated return to the events at Nibelheim. It's, I think it works really well, and it's interesting to finally get to piece together what really happened. Some smaller set pieces, like the cargo ship at events, are executed really well. The escape from Junin is also really fun, aside from one big glaring problem, which I hope you know what it is, and we'll get to it later. All of those thoughts together make us give the story a seven. Fine to decent. Moving on to characters. Looking at the heroes. Go from worst to best. Worst. Yuffie and Kate Sith. If we're talking just about Yuffie, we can compare her to Riku from Final Fantasy X. Both come from groups that are or were perceived as the enemy. Both groups suffer horrible losses. Both characters try to hide their pain. But Riku feels way more well-rounded. Selfie and Vanille from Final Fantasy VIII and XIII, respectively, also try to put on a cheerful face despite feeling horrible losses. But Yuffie is the worst written of the four of them. Kate Sith. How are we supposed to feel about Kate Sith? The double-crossing elements are the strongest things about him. Some of them are just recycled ideas that never made it into Celeste's storyline from Final Fantasy VI. How great would some more double-crossing from Celeste have been? These double-crosses that Kate Sith takes part in make him seem really awful and loathsome, but then we're supposed to feel something for him when he sacrifices himself in the Temple of the Ancients? And he doesn't even really sacrifice himself. 
one of his mechanical bodies is crushed and he's replaced in mere minutes. Also, he's kind of useless in battle. Next up, we've got at five points, Cloud and Barrett. Cloud, he's such a dude man, bro. Barrett, why is he sometimes played like the total idiot in the party? Like in the Haunted House and the Gold Saucer. The North Coral backstory is nice, but it doesn't make a ton of sense that the whole town is only blaming Barrett for the decisions that they also freely made. I know, I know, scapegoating, but it's still too intense. It doesn't seem fair. Another five, Sid. He's just so mean to Shara, it's unforgivable. Moving up to six points, Aerith. She's just a really odd character. She's got very bad people skills, which I guess makes sense considering her backstory. But like, for example, her actions on the date with Cloud are so awkward. And I know it's not her fault, but it's the writer's fault that her death is mourned for only a really brief moment in possibly the worst speech from Cloud. And then she seems to be just kind of forgotten for most of the rest of the story. When the party thinks that Cloud is dead, he's grieved way more than Aerith is grieved. Moving up, seven points, Vincent. I mean, he feels a little unnecessary, but he's kind of cool, right? Eight points, Red the 13th. A nice, well-rounded character with a beautiful backstory that comes to a really moving conclusion when he meets his father. It's nice that he gets to be both wise and conflicted, but why doesn't he speak up for more of the game? And our favorite character among the heroes with 10 points, Tifa. Even though Tifa is our favorite character, she's got some flaws. How many of the game's problems could have been avoided had she just spoken up about Cloud's real story? Though it is fun to see her struggle with that. Why does she only get cool hero moments when Cloud is not in the party? Why does she leave the party to care for Cloud? I thought she was invested in saving the world. With all these put together, that averages out to our heroes getting six. Moving on to the villains, again going from worst to best, but also sort of keeping them in chunks where they fit together. Three points, Don Corneo. He's just the worst and not in a fun to hate way. Looking at all the Turks as a group. Rude and Elena, we gave a four. Reno, we gave a five. Song though, he gets the most points because he seems to be the most competent. And the relationship between him and Aerith is interesting. But the Turks as a whole, well, what does the game want us to think of them? Are they a threat? Are they comic relief? Why are they all so obsessed of which boy likes which girl? Turks, six points. The Shinra board, Palmer, two. Is he just there to be a vehicle for fat phobic jokes? Reeve, three. I mean, I know he's canned pretty early in the game, and he actually is Kate Sith, and he's just such a confusing character, but Heidegger, six. Scarlet, nine. Scarlet and Heidegger are so twisted that we really wish they had a more satisfying ending to their stories. And a little bit of a bone to pick, the slap fight. Tifa is an accomplished martial artist. Scarlet is a weapons designer, and she's shown to be a good shot in one of the flashbacks. Why couldn't the showdown between them have been anything else? Shinra board, six. Dain, seven. He's kind of a tired old trope, but some of his lines, these hands are too bloodstained to hold Marlene, are kind of nice. Rufus, seven. He tries really hard to be intimidating, but it never quite lands. Sephiroth, nine. Remember what it was like to just be confusingly aroused by him as a 13 year old? No? Just us? President Shinra. It's a shame he's offed so easily. He's one of the game's most intimidating threats. 10 points. Hojo. A great creepy final battle the, and the great twist that he's Sephiroth's dad. He seems believable and hateable. 10 points. Genova. The game doesn't do a very good job of explaining when Sephiroth is Sephiroth and when he's actually Genova in disguise. And also, it doesn't explain why she can speak like him and know his thoughts. I'm sure there are satisfying answers to these questions, but the game doesn't really provide them. She does always feel like a threat, though, from the first time you see her in Midgar until the last time you fight her. 10. That makes all of the villains as a group 8 points. Now on to important NPCs. This first one is not on the list, but I would not be surprised if he had gotten a zero from us. The Doctor and Medeal. He's just so awful and has the worst bedside manner ever. Priscilla, two. Dio, 
Two, why are they there? Biggs, three, he doesn't really have much of a personality. Shira, four, why is she such a pushover? She probably knows she was right, and yet she lets Sid be super mean to her. Wedge, five, he's such a sweetheart. Marlene, five. Bugenhagen, five. Rumin and I disagree on Bugenhagen a little bit. Rumin really likes him. I kind of can't stand his design or how deus ex machina he, he is. Lucretia, seven. Her story is so sad. And when Vincent lies to her and says Sephiroth is dead, it's surprisingly emotionally effective. Elmira, eight. So sweet. And she obviously cares for Aerith a lot. Jesse, nine. Just very likable for a character who's in the game as little as she is. Important NPCs altogether? Six. Moving on to some costumes. I'm not going to go through everyone for this, but uh, Tifa for just... Why? Rufus. I, I really like his costume. He's slick. He's bratty looking, but still menacing. It works really well. Cloud. Eight. Effectively dull uniform turned everyday wear. Vincent. Eight. The nerdy boy in me kind of wants to dress like him for Halloween. Sephiroth. Nine. A little villain cliche, but it works and is effective. Costumes in general, six. Now here's a fun part. Nomura's designs for their characters versus what they actually look like on the screen. Rufus, two. He looks like the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man whenever he's on the screen. Aerith, four. Fluffy pink nylon snow pants. Really, most of the rest of these characters. Tifa, Barrett, Yuffie, Cloud, Red 13, Kate Sith. Vincent, Sid, Sephiroth, whether we like their designs or not, they translate pretty well to the polygons. Character dialogue. Overall, it gets an 8, but really, the translation in the original is pretty bad. Four points. If I push this button, they'll fall upside down and we'll have a squashed tomatoes. Weapon is a weapon. This guy are sick. Where the dialogue makes up points is that it makes sense for the characters to speak the way they do in the, for the most part. And not everyone speaks the same way. With all of that tons of information, that leaves us to give characters in general eight. Moving on to graphics. Graphics in the, in the regular gameplay are pretty clean and have no clipping. And it's a decent use of available hardened software. Cutscenes. Where this really falls off is that it's just so inconsistent to the gameplay. Glaringly different distractingly so. However, it is a pretty good use of available hard and software. When it's good, anything with Sephiroth, the motorcycle clip, most of the weapon stuff, other than weapons eyes. When it's bad, Tifa and Cloud falling into the live stream. What was that? It looks so hilarious and it shouldn't. Though the pre-rendered backgrounds tend to be beautiful, the blocky polygon characters end up looking even more awkward against them. There are quite a few screens in the game where it's incredibly difficult to tell what you can or can't walk on. Although, to the graphics' favor, any effects used to convey a dreamlike state are pretty effective in this game. All this overall, we gave graphics 8. Design. It's pretty interesting and original, but it's not super consistent. Um, there are some towns that look really cool, like Midgar, Cosmo Canyon, especially Buganagan's Little Planetarium. And there's some standout dungeons too, like the Northern Crater, the Underwater Reactor, the Forgotten City, and Great Glacier. Where the design really shines is in the monsters and the transportation. More on transportation later, but overall design, eight. Sound. The music. I mean, it's Uematsu. It's not going to be bad. Some highlights. Everything in the Northern Crater, especially One Winged Angel, but it's no dancing man. The opening music and every time it reappears, it's really good. Every world map theme in the game is excellent. The Forgotten Capital, Genova's battle theme, Costa del Sol, everything in Midgar, the battle theme at first until you hear it too many times by the end of the game. Those are all pretty great. There's some uh, bad music though, like the music in Cosmo Canyon. It's just... It's a little appropriate -y. The June and Marching music, it just goes on for so long. Gold Saucer, I know it's supposed to be obnoxious, but it doesn't have to be that obnoxious. All in all, the music, we gave an 8. Sound effects, 7, they're fine. Which gives sound overall an 8. Gameplay, map movement. 
moving around the world map is nice. It's 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 a ten. It's lovely. Through the towns and dungeons, it can be a little annoying sometimes with the aforementioned not being able to always tell what you can or can't walk on thing. But my favorite thing of the game is all the different transportation methods you get. The buggy is so fun. Ten. Tiny Bronco, 10. These two limited transportation options are handled more effectively in this game than in many other Final Fantasy games. It makes sense why we have the vehicles that we do and when we have them, and it makes sense why they can't take us everywhere. Plus, they're kind of fun to pilot. And the High Wind, also a 10. The highlight of flying around in the High Wind is chasing around Ultima Weapon on the, on the world map. The Battles, 10. It's an appropriate amount of random battles, and you have to do the appropriate amount of grinding. Not too much, not too little, just right. The summons feel like they're a bit much. Uh, you get new ones so quickly that the old ones rapidly become useless. The animations just get so long by the end of the game. And how many planet-destroying dragons do we really need? Moving on to minigames. Ah. Hmm. <sighs> Final Fantasy VII's minigames. Let's go from worst to best. Sector 5 Church Rolling Barrels, Arm Wrestling, Basketball, Wonder Catcher, Snowboarding, all two. Marching in Junin, Mog House, Shooting Coaster, all three. 3D Battler, four. Squats at the Gym, Running Past the Guards at Shinra Headquarters, Fort Condor, CPR, Saluting in Junin, Chocobo Racing, Excavation at Bone Village, and The Submarine, which is surprisingly tolerable even if it's incredibly confusing the first time you play. All six. The Sector 5 Reactor Button Pushing and the Motorcycle, seven. Although you're forced to play almost all of these games, and in general, they're just not fun. Mini games four. The camera throughout the game, 10. And the learning curve. You know, the game for the most part is surprisingly easy, I'm not mad at that, though. I don't mind an easy game. Learning curve, 10. That gives gameplay overall an 8. When you add up all of these numbers, the total score that we give the game is uh, 78%. Although, with the scores that we feel like the game deserves, Ramin gave the game a 77. I gave it an 86. All of that averaged together gives the game an 80%, which is a B-. I think that's accurate. You know, it's it's one of those things. Whenever I tell people that Final Fantasy VII is not my favorite Final Fantasy, they think I'm horrible and they think I hate it. I don't hate this game. I think it's pretty good and Ramin feels the same way. It's just not our favorite. Not our favorite doesn't mean you hate something. So if you ever decide to play through this game again, I encourage you to really seriously look at all this stuff. See how you feel about it. If you still feel the way you did when you first played it, that's great. I, I'm happy for you. If you don't, that's also good. You could like it more, you could like it less. Actually, when Ramin and I just played through it again, I liked it more than I thought I did. Still not my favorite, though. Anyway, thanks for watching. And uh, you're such a great person to be confined in a small space with four months at a time.